Hey there, welcome back. This week we're going to be talking about seller appointments, what to do, how to prep for them, and how to make sure that you walk away with that signed agreement. Remember that we sell peace of mind. And what does that mean exactly? That means that we are creating a seamless and easy process for the seller. We want to create raving fans and we want them to know that we are trustworthy and honest professionals in our industry and we care deeply about our reputation. This means that we are going to go above and beyond for them throughout this transaction. And even further, we don't want to just end the relationship at this deal. We want to make sure that this is potentially a lifelong partnership so that we can continue to get referrals. So how exactly are we going to prepare for this appointment? We're going to review our notes that we had originally written down from our original cold call with the seller. We're going to review their motivation, their timeline, their price, you know, review the comps that we pulled for the property. We're going to make sure that we're looking at our lower range. Okay. So when we pull comps, sometimes we have a, a range between, um, lowest to highest sell point, depending on grades of materials that we use. Okay. So we want to make sure that we're using the lower end comps. And then we're going to make sure that we have a game plan so that we go in there knowing exactly how much our max offer amount is. And, you know, just kind of game plan what you think the seller is going to be thinking and feeling throughout the conversation, you know, just by the previous conversations that you've had with them, what some of their objections have already been. You just want to game plan how you want to go into the appointment. You also want to make sure that you have your contracts printed out and available for easy e-sign. So while you're at the appointment, you can either pull out the contract and have them sign right there or send it to them via email. And then before you go to the appointment, you also want to look over the scope of work. So that way, when you're going throughout the house, you can make sure you need, that you check off, oh, the kitchen counters were this type and the floors were this type and the roof was this old. You know, you just look over the scope of work before you go so you know what to look for and make sure that you have that printed off as well as your comps. And then, of course, relax. Relax before you go in there whether that means you need to listen to a really upbeat song to get you hype, or if you need to listen to a calm song to just calm your nerves, you know, just whatever is best for you, relax before you go. So we have five stages for our appointment, and you'll notice that the five stages on the appointment closely resemble the original cold call that we had with them. So we're going to introduce ourselves and build rapport. We're going to reestablish their motivation and their timeline. As we're walking through and touring the house, we're going to try to get an idea of what we think they might say no to later in the presentation. We're going to handle their pre-rebuttals and objections. Okay. And then we're going to sit down and we're going to make the offer. We're going to assume the close, build rapport, and rehash again, okay? So each of the five stages have three main locations as we're touring the property. The first location is going to be in the foyer, the main entranceway, as you're making the introduction and starting to build rapport. The second location is going to be while you're touring the house. This is when you're handling the pre-rebuttals and reestablishing their motivation. And then your third location is gonna be somewhere comfortable, like sitting down at the kitchen table or at the couch. So that way, when you present the offer, the seller is more receptive because they are more comfortable and they've been able to relax. The five stages in three locations do not always align in that order. So try to be flexible. Please always try to do stages four and five at a comfortable place. It might not always be the kitchen table or a couch. If the house is vacant, it might be standing outside or, you know, meeting them at a Starbucks a couple of streets away. Just get somewhere comfortable. But remember, it is important that you cover all five stages of the appointment, no matter the location. So use your entire time with the seller to continue building rapport and really demonstrate that you offer peace of mind. All right, so stage one and location one is in the foyer when you first walk into the house. Remember, if they feel like they know you and they trust you and they like you, 
they're generally going to work with you. So you're walking up to the door, you've got everything with you, you've got your comps, you've got the contract, you've got your computer possibly, and maybe you even have a business card. So you're walking up to the door and you're going to knock three times, one, two, three, and then ring the doorbell and you're going to take a step back. And when you take a step back, you don't want to be square with the seller when, when they open the door. You want to be at a 45 degree angle. Well, so you don't come off as so aggressive and you want to face forward and have a smile on your face. When the seller opens the door, be ready to present your handshake and possibly your business card. As the seller answers the door, greet them by using their name and ask if you can come in. So it might sound something like this. Hey, Jim, Alexis with Gypsy Endeavors. It's so great to meet you today. May I come in? The seller is likely going to say, yes, come in. Be enthusiastic, be excited, and be confident. This is where you start the small talk, ask them about their day has been, and start building rapport. See if you can find items either on the seller's person or immediately in the home that you recognize might be of value to the seller. And it's something that you can speak about as well. So for instance, if they have a poster of Batman, maybe you can mention how you always loved watching Batman when you were a child. You know, just find something that you can relate to and use that as a piece for building rapport. And then after some small talk, before touring the house, we're going to go into the disarming statement. Make sure that you're using good eye contact throughout this disarming statement and that you're slightly nodding your head up and down and left to right throughout a majority of the statement. Starting at the beginning, we're going to start nodding our head in an up and down motion. We're going to tour the property together, Jim. And if it sounds like we can work together, that's great. We're excited for the potential of helping you with an easy sale. That's certainly the goal. But if it turns out that we can't work together, that's okay too. I promise it won't hurt my feelings. At the end of the day, we just wanna create a win-win solution for both of us. It's important to say the disarming statement exactly this way. If you deliver it truthfully and with confidence, it should increase your conversion ratio by over 50%. At this point, the seller might say, okay, great. Now we're gonna reestablish rapport and tour the house. All right, Jim, let's go ahead and tour the house. You mind if I set my bag over there by the table? Remember, you want to set your bag in a good and comfortable location so that when you move to stages four and five of the script, your bag's there. So that just automatically leads the seller back to where you originally set your things. So have an idea before you even start the tour of the property where you want to close. Go ahead and set your bag over there by the table. When you set it down, ask, Jim, do you mind if I take some notes and a couple pictures while we're walking? So as we're touring the property and we're looking at all of the things like the roof and the systems and what kind of work the property is going to need, we're also going to reestablish the seller's motivation, their timeline, if or if not they need a lease back, their price, and we're also going to find out if they have any experience selling to an investor like ourselves and if we have any competition to work with. And this is going to happen all before we make the offer. So if we're asking about their motivation, we're going to refer back to their notes. Why are they selling the property? Well, if they came from a foreclosure list, it might sound something like this. Hey, Jim, when did you say the foreclosure date was set for? Whatever they answer. No worries, we can handle that for you. Or if you pulled a probate list. Hey, Jim, has the will been probated? I can't remember. And then whatever they say, no worries, we can handle that for you. Whatever their motivation is, say no worries, we can handle that for you. If they ask how or any other questions and you don't know the answer, you can say, let me find out and I'll get back to you. Or I'll have a specialized member from our team reach out to you and answer all of those questions. 
So you can deflect on somebody else and then you go back to your network after you're done and say, hey, this is what happened. This is what I need. This is what the seller needs, this is the situation. And we'll all jump in and we'll work on it together, okay? You're not alone. <laughs> so we're continuing to walk around the property. Potentially now we're on the exterior of the house getting ready to come back inside or finishing up in one of the bedrooms, still walking around, okay? And you're gonna ask the seller, hey Jim, remind me, how soon are you looking to move? And you're gonna lock in their timeline. And then depending on the situation, you may ask if they need a lease back. Not all sellers are going to require this. And it may not be necessary to ask all sellers this either. If they say, what's a lease back? Say, a leaseback allows you to close quickly, get your money sooner, and allow you time to move out. We're going to be going over leasebacks in depth next week, so stay tuned for that. So now we're going to ask them about their price and experience working with other investors if they've potentially rehabbed properties before, if they're a contractor, if they've bought and sold homes, we wanna know what their experience is. So we wanna build a little bit of rapport in this section, okay? And then we also wanna find out if we have any competition. Are there any other wholesalers or investors coming into the property and submitting bids? Have they talked to offer patterns at low or any of those other companies? In this section, we're just collecting data to handle our pre-rebuttals for the next section, okay? So if we think our price is gonna be the issue with the seller, we want to make them see how their house needs repairs, okay? So we might open up with a question like, hey Jim, a lot of our sellers like to give us feedback and suggestions for future updates to the property. Hey Jim, a lot of sellers like to give us suggestions for future updates to the property. If you were gonna change anything in your home or remodel, what would you change? What would you do? If they start saying, oh yeah, I would change the master bathroom and completely redo the kitchen. Well, then you can start spitting out numbers like, okay, yeah, that'll be 10 grand and the kitchen will be 20 grand. You can just start throwing out all these big numbers. And this will get an idea of if they say, oh, well, I'm a contractor and I know that I can use it for this. Then at that point, you'll know what the seller's experience is in rehab. If the seller says something along the lines of, oh, the property's perfect, well, then you know you might be off in price. So you're probably going to need to say the price pre-rebuttal in the next section. And then you might ask them the question, hey, how familiar are you to selling to an investor like Gypsy Endeavors? Depending on what they tell you in this section, we'll tell you if you need to handle the investor pre-rebuttal in the next section. Another question that is always great to ask is, hey, is there anybody other than us coming out here? Are you entertaining any other offers? Are you entertaining other options to sell? Some of those questions so that you know what to handle in the next section. All right, so now we're jumping into the pre-rebuttal and objections phase. The goal here is to guess which one of the two common objections the seller is going to have. And then you're gonna to wanna to handle this objection with a pre-rebuttal before you ever even make the offer. Remember, this part is kind of like a game. If we clear the objections out of the way, we remove the seller's reasons to say no. So if we think that we might have other competition with investors, we may say something along the lines of this. Well, Jim, there's two types of investors. The investor that can contract a property and the type that can actually close. Interestingly enough, 95% of the people who call themselves investors aren't truly investors. Do you ever hear the ads on the radio about getting rich quick by flipping real estate? the seller will likely say yes. Those radio ads teach people how to tie up properties with contracts. And then instead of closing, they resell your contract to another end buyer, which doesn't give you peace of mind, does it? And you can see how that's a problem. There's a few things that you should check for when working with an investor, and we call it POET. POET stands for proof of funds, 
option period, earnest money, and track contracts. If you don't have a proof of funds from a reputable bank, potentially you could go get pre-qualified from a hard money lender to show, hey, this is my proof of funds. You can also get a fake proof of funds if you needed to. Maybe you skip this part completely. The second thing that you mentioned here is option money. Option money is the money that you give the seller for the option to purchase the contract. In that time, you get the property under contract and as a wholesaler, yes, you are going to remarket that property and send it to investors and then get investors bids and sell the contract, okay? So your 10 day option gives you time to find the investor that's going to purchase the property. Because if you can't find the investor, well, now you're tied up in this contract, right? So when we get an option period of generally 10 days, sometimes we can get it for 14 days or less or 21 days or less, but 10 days or less is average. So you wanna make sure that if you can't find a buyer that you cancel the contract before five o'clock on the 10th day. So if you sign it on the first, then you wanna make sure that on the 10th, it's canceled before five. And generally the option money is like 50 to hundred dollars. It doesn't have to be that. You can definitely give less. You could potentially give more. Generally we give like 25 bucks an option. The third thing that you mentioned here is earnest money. And earnest money is what you put down as a deposit for the house to show that you're putting your money where your mouth is essentially. Generally your earnest money is 1% of the sales price of the contract the sales price that you and the seller agree upon. That is not rule and it's not law. It doesn't have to be 1%. It can be more, it can be less. You just have to give some amount of consideration. And then the fourth thing that we mentioned here is TREC contracts. We say that there's generally no other reason to use a TREC contract than if you're selling out of state or if you've just got a really unique situation going on. The TREC contracts are written to protect the seller and the buyer. On top of that, if you book an appointment with the seller and then I book an appointment with the seller and you present a two-page contract and then I present a 10-page TREC contract, that just looks so much more credible, okay? So the likelihood of the seller feeling more comfortable with our contracts is better Yes, you can definitely go get your own contracts made through an attorney. You can download some offline. Wouldn't recommend that. Make sure that you completely understand your contracts before you sign anything. Next week, we're also going to be going over our contracts, so stay tuned. You're going to wrap up here by telling the seller you want to work with poets. And the seller will say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Now we're going to rebuttal their price objection before they even know they have it. So as we're touring the home, we're notating everything that we see that we need to fix about the property. And we're asking the seller if they were going to flip it, what they would do. This gets them excited and interested in the transaction. So when we asked the seller earlier what they would do with the property, we may or may not have thrown out a number for that fix. So here we might ask the seller, okay, Mr. Seller, we know that we're going to have to replace the roof and do some foundation repairs. Have you gotten quotes for either one of those projects? You're kind of tallying up everything that you see that's wrong with the property, throw out the numbers. And this will again tell you how involved the seller is in on their project, what their expectations are, and how to move forward with this section. So at this stage, we've seen the property and we've handled some of these pre-objections right before we're getting ready to sit down with the seller, either at the couch or at the kitchen table. So now we're in the fourth stage and we're moving to our third location, our comfortable location where we had originally set our bags. At this point, the seller's already decided if they like us or not, if they trust us, and if we're truly experts in our domain. All we need to do now is properly set up the offer and get them to say yes. So we're gonna set up the offer using the comps and repairs explanation. First, we're gonna start off by reviewing similar homes in the area that have been renovated and updated. And this is gonna give us an idea of what your property could go for 
assuming that these repairs have been made and that they're the same quality or better than these other homes. I'd say that based on these numbers, your home totally fixed up would be around $250,000, okay? Second, we determine how much in repairs your home needs to make it look equal or greater than these other comps that we have shown here. So we're flipping through the pictures and we're comparing the property side by side. And you're looking at your scope of work that you've been filling out throughout the appointment. And potentially you're also pulling up pictures of specific things that you've just caught pictures of while you're walking. Like if there's a big hole in the roof or if you see a big foundation crack in the wall, you know, you can bring those items up again, okay? Which if we made all these repairs, I think that would cost around $55,000. Third, we calculate our holding costs, our closing costs, taxes and interest, and then we subtract out the repairs. So based on the condition of the home, we would be at $135,000. And then shut up. And I mean that in the nicest way. Please don't say anything. Read their body language, read their, read their facial expressions, read what they're feeling. Don't say anything. Say your number and just be quiet, okay? If the seller says, okay, where do we go from here? Then you're gonna go straight for the close. You're gonna review the contract and you're gonna tell them what the next stages are to get them to their check at closing. If the seller says, is that offer firm? That's a little less than I was thinking. You almost have them keep the negotiations going, okay? Ask them, where do they need to be? If you're not far off on price, like 10K or less, then you would say something like, mm, I, I gave you my highest and best, but give me just one second. Let me look at my numbers. And then look at your computer, rerun some numbers, do some calculations on your phone, give it a couple seconds. I came up to 132,000. And then you can keep going with the negotiations from there. At that point, hopefully the seller will say yes. And they're just going to lock up the contract because now you're all are 8K off. And, you know, just play those numbers as they need to go. You know, those numbers aren't always going to be accurate and for you. So know what your max offer is before you go in. And if you get the vibe that the seller is trying to sell you their house, trying to tell you the reasons why they should, why you should invest in it, you know, you might have more negotiation room than a seller that's completely just standoffish. But if the seller says something like, no, we're completely way off, then ask, do you mind me asking how you came up with that figure? And they might say something like, oh, well, we need to pay off the mortgage and we have taxes and potentially there's another lien that we don't know about. If the seller sends something like that, then you have to dive deeper into their situation, ask more questions, really find out their motives and what's going on. If the seller says, well, we just got an offer from a family who just knocked on our door and wants to move into the house and they're not going to do any rehab to it. And they gave me an offer for... 190,000. Then you might rebuttal with, okay, Mr. Seller, I completely understand. Just remember that this is our business and our livelihood. So when we give you our offer, we're taking into consideration us holding, us holding the property, paying the closing costs, the survey, the title fees, you know, all those fees, and additionally making a profit to pay off our crews. So I completely respect and understand if you have that higher offer. But because we're taking the extra risk on holding the property and doing these repairs, that's why our offer is lower. And the seller might say something, okay, well, like that's understandable, you know, just, well, if you have that offer, I would totally recommend taking it. And I would be more than willing to review the contract for you. At the end of the day, if the seller is dead set on the price, and you cannot go up any higher, then maybe you can go back and rerun your numbers and see if there's a creative financing option or a subject to, or a different strategy for the seller. Potentially you can list it on the market with your realtor that's in your network. You know, There's a 
If you feel the gut feeling that you can really help the seller out, then don't just drop the ball on them. Continue to help them out, even if it's not a cash offer, even if it's not you wholesaling the property. Because the referrals that come back from working direct with seller have the highest closing rates out of any other marketing campaign. Okay, so always be a resource. So we asked the seller, how did they come up with that figure? And whatever they say, say, okay, I completely understand. Let me look at these repairs again and see if there's anything else we can cut out. I think 150,000 makes sense for us. Let's go ahead and do it. This is a very factual statement. It creates a win-win scenario and you've assumed the close. So now you're going to move in to assuming the close and rehashing. And you're still doing this at the same location as you were before. At this point, you should have them and you should be going over the contract and explaining the process that's going to get them from where we're sitting right now to the closing table with a check in their hand or a deposit in their bank account. Okay, let me walk you through the contract real quick. And you're just gonna hit these quick few wickets, okay? We use contracts that are created by the state of Texas so that it's fair for the buyers and sellers. We're gonna put down X amount of dollars in earnest money to show you that we're serious. This earnest money is going to go straight to the title company. We're also going to be giving you option money for our option period. Our option period is going to end within X amount of days, seven to 10 days, whatever that number is, okay? Once you sign the contract, we'll send the earnest money and the option money over to the title company. When would you like to close? So after they give you their roundabout closing day, or, or if you talk about it and you walk in through it and you say, okay, well, it's going to take you three weeks to pack up the house and we still got to find you a place to move and all of these timelines and all these events have to happen. Make sure that you walk them through the process so that you don't leave them hanging and going, well, damn, well, I just signed this contract. Now what? Make sure that they understand the process and what's going to happen after you walk out the door. And you talk about, hey, these are all the things that we're going to help you move. Do we need a U-Haul truck? Do we need to get movers in here? You know, get these questions out of the way. So that way the deal doesn't fall apart after you've got the contract signed. So you've got all this stuff rehashed and figured out. All right. And now you're going to say, awesome. Now all we need you to do is sign the agreement. And then you're going to point to where they need to sign. Or if they don't want to do wet signatures and they would prefer you send them the electronic copy, then you can whip out your computer or your iPad, whatever, and send them the electronic copy. And at that point, I would wait for them to get it and pull it up on their phone and sign it there. Please do not leave this appointment without getting the contract signed. If they give you the objection of, I need to have my attorney review the contract, never tell them no. Give them that opportunity to say, oh, I completely understand. I'll check back up with you in 48 hours and see if your attorney has reviewed it. But I'm going to leave you here with this blank copy or with this hard copy. But that's not going to happen because we're going to get them to sign it at the appointment. <laughs> now they've signed the contract. Okay, now you're going to follow up with, great, we're all set. Let's go ahead and schedule a one-hour appointment for our for our contractors and investment partners to come out here, just double check and make sure that I didn't miss anything, okay? And then you're going to set that appointment, let them know that when you're gonna follow up with them and book it on the calendar, okay? And let them know that we're gonna be in contact with them throughout the transaction, you know? So before you leave, you definitely wanna stay there and build some more rapport and make sure that you leave on a good and positive note, okay? Make sure that the seller completely understands the transaction from beginning to finish, knows the steps, knows what's going to occur, and that you've answered their questions. And now it's time to practice. It's time to go to work. We're going to start booking some appointments, okay? So I've uploaded a scope of work worksheet in Google Drive, which is going to walk you through everything that you want to check and make sure that you've gotten pictures of and that you've at least analyzed and looked at throughout the appointment, you know, because I'm not going through each house with you yet, potentially, maybe I can, but I'm not going through each house with you, checking all the faucets and making sure that each electrical outlets 
you know, working and in working order, you want to make sure that you have a, a baseline knowledge of what to look for when you're walking into a property. And that scope of work worksheet should give you a pretty good idea. And of course, you're going to use that worksheet when you go out to the appointment with the seller. So go out, book appointments, and practice the script. Every week, track your KPIs. If you got an appointment, how many pre-qualified leads did it take to book this appointment? Out of those pre-qualified leads, how many people did you have to talk to? Keep measuring these KPIs. You can only get better. Next week, we're going to be going over contracts and documentation and more in depth. So that way, when you're presenting these documents to the seller, you know exactly how to walk them through. So stay tuned for next week. Can't wait to talk to you soon.